you were talking about. I had no idea whatsoever. Sometimes, as I've said several times, we think that the, that the world of the first century, the idolatrous pagan world, was basically like the people of denominationalism or Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodox or whatever, and they weren't. They were so far from that and their outlook on life and their concept of why they're here. They had no concept of needing salvation, at least the way the Bible sets it out. They did not think of the gods, whatever pantheon of gods they had, as being individual and sacrificing and loving and caring. Had nothing like that. And it's really a frightful place. But you can see why the gospel spread so fast in a world that had no hope. Those folks did not have hope like you're familiar with from your study of the scriptures. This morning we saw early on a man who was a devout man who was anchored in the scriptures but did not know the gospel. And we saw how that Philip worked with him. And we tried to draw lessons from that about the church today and our being prepared to deal with the realities that are around us. And this afternoon I would like to look at another account of conversion that's found in Acts chapter 17. Now, when you get this far over, you come a long way from where we were this morning with Philip preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch. Saul of Tarsus is now the Apostle Paul. Saul of Tarsus is now suffering much for the cause of Christ. He's a completely different man and his whole outlook on life from what he was when he held the clothes of those that stoned Stephen and breathed out threatening and slaughter against the church and wrought havoc against them. And we find him introduced, well not introduced to us, but introducing what's going on in Acts 17, dealing with a people completely different from the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, they have been, that is, Paul was run out of some places. We're not going to go back into that. One reason is because I protect myself. I'll bog down preaching on that, and then we'll get to what I want to get to tonight if I drop back too early. <laughs> so we want to look at verse 16 of Acts 17. Paul's in Athens. He's there because he had to leave due to persecution in another place. And he's asked uh, Silas and Timotheus to come, told them to come and meet him. And verse 16 begins as Luke records, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. I want to pause right there. We saw the dedication of Philip this morning. We saw his devout conduct his willingness to take God at his word, and as soon as he understood his duty to God, he acted upon it. We see Paul's concern for lost souls. He's mindful of the Great Commission. He's mindful of the gospel being the power of God to save. He wrote those words, Romans 1.16. And he sees this city, Athens, that the Western world considers to be this, the seat of philosophy. It was then. And we see him waiting there for two people that he needs and enjoys the fellowship of. But he is a Christian through and through, and more than that, he has the apostleship of Jesus Christ, and a special one because he's the apostle to the Gentiles. And how is he moved when he sees a city wholly given to idolatry? Now, what you're seeing here in Athens is not any different from what you see all over the Roman Empire. You could have said that about Rome. You could have said that about a lot of places. But this is where Paul is right now. And we see something about the character of Paul, the dedication of Paul, the faith of Paul, and how he could not stand false doctrine and false gods. For the Scripture says his spirit was stirred in him. Now let me ask you a question. We are the church of the living God. 
God expects us to be the leavening influence for good through our conduct, putting the New Testament into practice, through our teaching, through exemplary lives. We look round about us, we see a world that is going more and more back toward the direction of the first century world. Now let me pause you and say this. We see lots of problems. And those roughly my age and older can remember over the last 50, 60 years or more how radically things have changed to get to where they are now. But I promise you, they're nowhere near what it was in the first century. Because this was the culmination of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, as is described in generalities, but graphically in Romans 1, among the Gentiles in general as they desired not to retain God in their knowledge, and God gave them over to these things. The point I'm making is, is as the church, does anything stir us up? Do we look round about us and are we stirred up as Paul was stirred up because we see the things in the world that's taking place? Folks, the Republican Party does not have the answer to it. The independents do not have the answer to it. No human philosophy does not have the answer to it. Now, it doesn't mean in some things they don't have some things better than others. That's obvious for anybody to see that keeps up with much of anything going on. We recognize that. But because maybe a political party is far better than another one, it will never take the place of the gospel of Jesus Christ as to what needs to be in this world. Never. Whatever parts of the New Testament of Jesus Christ is incorporated into the moral standards of whatever group it is, that's wonderful. Glad it is. I'll support them before I'll support others that are running this as hard the other direction in service to Satan as I possibly can, as long as all other things are scripturally equal. But let us not ever get in our mind as Christians, defined as it's defined in the New Testament, and the church as it is defined, and both as they're used in the New Testament, get the idea that any of these secular institutions can provide what the world needs. They cannot. They will not. What we need to know is that it is the church of Christ as it appears on the pages of the New Testament and the Christians who make it up that has exactly as they walk faithful to the Word of God what this world needs. That we must remember. And our lives should reflect it in what we say. Now, that may mean that we comment on things that generally people talk about being political. Because as I said this morning, really life in general is based in morality of some sort. And then specifically when it comes to the gospel, you're talking about matters of religion and spiritual religion that is authorized by the New Testament. But let us not think that we're ever going to get an Apostle Paul to run for president or senator or county judge. If you were of the character of Paul, I firmly believe on the basis of the Scriptures that you'd be running right the opposite direction. What you're going to see is a man that the Holy Spirit has recorded by Luke for us to see. He stands there as an Apostle of Christ in a city wholly given to idolatry and all that that implies, folks. And it means all manner of immorality that they thought nothing of. And he's moved. Notice immediately, wholly given to idolatry. His spirit's stirred up in him because of that. Now look at verse 17. Therefore, in the light of the fact of the state of the reality of that place, what did it cause Paul to do? He disputed in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Now that's what him being stirred up over the mess that the world was in then caused him to do. Question, how does it affect us? Do we just... 
kind of blend in and going about our daily lives, earning our livings and, you know, being young, growing older, getting older, raising our kids, getting decrepit and finally dying and we've lived a godly life? Or do we venture out? Do we say, that's not right. Here is what is right. That's what Paul's going to do here. And he doesn't begin with everybody being the caliber of people that the Ethiopian eunuch was. And if you go over to Acts chapter 10, he doesn't even have that kind of Gentile to deal with to a great extent like Cornelius was because he's described as a devout man even as those Jews on the day of Pentecost were described as devout men. Because it's this comment of verse 17 brings him down, that is Luke in the record of it, to what he says in verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. Well, I imagine, have you ever thought about that? Here are these characters who are of certain philosophies. We're not going to go into the details of them because it doesn't make any difference right now because there are some of these who are involved with that city being wholly given over to idolatry and the false philosophies that govern people of that time. They encounter him. How would you like to be a false teacher and encounter Paul? Who do you think is going to win on that? He's the apostle of Christ. He has the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. That is, he can speak as the Spirit gives him utterance. One of the promises that Jesus made in John chapters 14, 15, and 16 is that when you have the need to speak what needs to be spoken at a given time, it'll be given you in that selfsame hour what to speak. So when I read the inspired record of Luke, and I read what Luke by inspiration recorded that Paul said by the Holy Spirit, I know God's speaking. And I know that's what I ought to speak. So notice how they view him. What will this babbler say? Now, they're pretty much saying, I'm a Ph.D. from Harvard, and who is this character? Babbler has been translated seed picker. That's how they viewed Paul. What they had heard had come out of the discussions you find in verse 17. Some, uh, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods. Uh, he seemeth. One of the things, you, you may not realize this, that you're taught in English in college, and it's not all wrong. But when you have a perception of a thing, you don't say, that is the way it is. You say, it seems to be such and such. I remember Brother Warren talking about how that philosophers who differed with one another in their conventions of philosophers would speak. And they don't, he said they would not speak definitively. And he was members of those organizations where they would have conventions and get-togethers. He says, here's the way they do it. They come up there and they say, well, now it seems to me this, that, and the other, and they'd state their case on whatever it was. Then another would come up that was completely opposite from the first one, and he would respond, well, yes, yeah, but it seems to me. No one ever spoke in a definitive this is the way it is, and what you just said was wrong, and I'm telling you the right way. That's the world. This is happening all around us. We live in a, a world of people who it seems to me. The liberals around us would be happy for us to talk about Christianity and embrace them in it. Well, yeah, this seems to me, but you're so-and-so, and I know that seems to you that way, and it seems to so-and-so that both of us may, but, you know, we, let's not be judgmental. <clears throat> Why can't we all just get along? And that's the view. Paul did not have that view, and it's not recorded in your Bible to teach us that we could have that view. He did set forth what was strange to them. And here's why that they said that. Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, I do not believe, because of what I know the Bible teaches, <coughs> that Paul would say, well, now you fellows have had your say and your different views and what it seems to you. Let me tell you what it seems to me about somebody called Jesus down there in Palestine not many years ago and what I've heard and it seems to me about him dying and being resurrected. What do you think of that? 
It wasn't presented that way. And you can look at anything Paul preached and you will not see it presented that way. But they heard that, and you've got to remember, and I think Jeff brought this up a while back, that the Gentiles, Greeks in particular, thought that the body itself was a prison house. Now, you're going to fare far better outside this body. So if you're going to talk about coming back into this body, we don't hear anything about it. And you'll see when they cut him off down here later. It was when he began to talk about the resurrection. But there's the blunt of his preaching. He preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. What did Philip preach this morning? Jesus. He preached earlier things concerning the kingdom of heaven and the name Jesus Christ. And now Paul's preaching Jesus. What do you think they're preaching? Evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. That He is the Savior. That He is the way, the truth, and the life and that no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Well, all right, they say, come on up here to our scholarly circles, verse 19. They took him and brought him up in the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. Now think about this. This is a world wherein what we take for granted, and we're very familiar with, but it's new to us. We never heard it. Does that tell you the state that that world was in when it came to religion? This is something nobody's ever known. They don't understand it. It's beyond them regarding their gods, how their gods deal with them, about life, about life in the flesh, about death. You know, used to, and we still do, at least those who are faithful trying to preach the whole counsel of God, will say what we need to study is where we came from, what we're here for, and where we're going. And that's basically what you will see in these sermons. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know, therefore, what these things mean. Now think of the fundamental here, the first principles. He's talking about one called Christ, the deity of Christ, the suffering of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. These folks don't have any idea of this. Now notice what's wrong with these fellows. Are they diligent pursuers of truth? Remember our sermon last Sunday night about truth? About people's concepts of truth? I seriously doubt it. That's why Pilate would ask Jesus what is truth. So that runs through the whole of the fabric of their cultural viewpoints. Parenthetically, Luke says, for all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time and nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So they found somebody that's got a new thing. But are they seeking the truth? Are they interested in something new? Something new to discuss? Well, verse 22 begins a new paragraph. Paul stands in the midst of Mars Hill and he says, Ye men of Athens. Now, now notice how solid this gets immediately. I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. Now that means religious. You're very religious. Paul knows exactly what he's going to do because of what he says that came from his observance of the city being given wholly over to idolatry. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare unto you. Now that word ignorantly was completely and totally politically incorrect to this crowd. They were the ones that did not see themselves as ignorant. They've already called him a seed picker. <clears throat> so now he says, I'm going to set the record straight. Notice there's no, it seems to me, him declare I, unto you. Notice how he begins with the people who do not have any background knowledge in the Old Testament. Remember how that the eunuch could say because he believed in the Old Testament scriptures and he was perusing them as the word of God. He was meditating on them. He was reading Isaiah 53 which is of course a prophecy of the Christ, the sufferings of Christ, the death of Christ. 
You can begin there. You can't begin there with this bunch. Can't at all. What does that say to us in the church as to being a discerning people, as to where we have to begin with people if we have any hope of trying to reach them? I would say this fits more our culture and society than does the case of conversion this morning. Go out and try to talk to people and see where you get. They don't know where there is an Isaiah. may not even know where there's an Old Testament. I can think of some folks that wouldn't know Isaiah from the Sears catalog, and they probably don't know what that is. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. I've heard some people say, well, what do we do if we go into a place and they don't even have any background in the Bible? How do we preach? Do they ever go and read right here? Here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. Now, this is not new. This is the way Paul would deal with folks all over the empire that are of this caliber. If you go back over to chapter 14, you find Paul, uh, Lystra, and you find a situation without going back into it in detail. Paul says of God to these same kind of pagan people, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own way. Now hold that, because look what you're going to find in verse 30 a little later on, said by him, the Areopagus. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. It's basically what he's saying right over here, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, now here's the point. He left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. What you've got in Acts 17 is a much more detailed, expanded outline than what Paul says that Luke records in those two verses. So he starts out by saying, here's my affirmation. Here's what I'm affirming. God that made the world and all things therein. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Now what is all over that area? Still the ruins of which are there today. Every kind of temple you could possibly see. It's amazing to go through that part of the world. To go to Rome, to go to Athens. Any place I ever visited over there has ruins of all sorts. And there's a lot that's all gone. But it's amazing the ruins are still there. And it all has to do with gods and temples get, uh, dedicated to them. That's all those people knew. Notice that he hits also right at the heart of what they did. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. That tells you something about how these folks thought about those gods. They were basically superhuman beings. Seeing that he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Something had to create all that you see now. He's appealing to the people's own natural understanding. Where did this come from? Did it just happen? We deal with that in dealing with atheists today. You have to come back down to one of two things in the matter in the study of origins. Either matter is eternal... Our mind, there's a mind that's eternal. And there's nothing that indicates, as Brother Warren used to say, that dead rocks and dirt got busy and created everything we've got. There's nothing. It's always a mind that thinks and is able by power to bring into being what it thinks and to keep it moving. And Paul, on a very fundamental level, is appealing to these people in that way trying to dispel their idea of, of the gods that they had. Notice he's made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Now that was revolutionary. I don't know how much Paul understood what the Holy Spirit gave him to say about that, but what it's saying is that it doesn't make any difference about whether you're a black man or oriental or uh, whatever you are physically. He made of one blood. You can take transfusions from everybody. And this is revolutionary. 
long before there was a sci uh, scientific words to describe all of this. And notice he hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. When men go out in space, they have to take the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation with them. They do that in a spaceship and in the space clothes they wear. When they leave this world made for them, they have to take it all with them or they can't live. That they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of them. Hmm. This world is made for us to look at it, think about it, and it points to the eternal mind that created it. It's exactly what he says. And he says he's not far from anybody. When we learn to think straight and try to not take the position that something comes from nothing. Well, there's no evidence anywhere in any science that something comes from nothing. Quantum physics tries to say that, but when you understand a little bit of it, though I don't know that I ever understand even, I don't know they understand it, a lot of it, when you look at what they're talking about, they can't say that it came from nothing. There is a something. They just can't explain that something that brought about whatever's going on. Nothing doesn't bring forth something. It just doesn't, never has, never will. And when you say nothing, remember you're saying not one thing. Notice about this God. For in Him we live and move and have our being. And then he does something that shows you his education as a Hellenistic Jew. Because he knows their own writings. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. In other words, somebody down the line without being inspired looked at everything and saw the design of it and knew there had to be a designer capable of bringing them out. Your own people have said that. Now where are you in this? That's why he's bringing this thing home to these philosophers. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, and there's who it is, we ought not to think that the Godhead's likened to gold or silver or stone graven by art, man's device. Well, you've got to remember you can stand there and look all around you in those days, and you're going to see everything he just described in the latter part of verse 29 that those folks said had to do with deities. And now he brings it home. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You'll never see Paul's sermons where he does not bring it down to the fact that you are responsible for what you believe and what you do, that you are a created being, that you are created by God who created all things, and that God doesn't need a thing. He doesn't even need you. But since he created you, He's made it so you could find him and that you could serve him. And you better do it, and here's why. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, he evidently been preaching that all along. They just at this time hadn't heard about it, and God in his infinite wisdom saw fit to record this part through the pen of Luke. Because remember back up here in verses 18 and 19 that they've encountered him. Remember what he had been doing in verse 17. And remember all of it had to do with preaching the gospel, God's power to save them. So they want to know better about him, verse 19. And they tell him what they want to know and Paul tells them. And he brings it down to where they have to make a decision. There's a day coming when you're going to give an account of the deeds done in the body. And how do we know this? How do we know the gospel's true? God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And as surely as he raised Jesus Christ from the dead, then he's going to judge the world. But now watch what comes out and dominates them. They don't try to answer him. Look at verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. They laughed at him. Remember what we said last week about the sermon on how people 
They laughed at him. They mocked him. And others said, we'll hear thee again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damanus, and others with them. Sometimes you don't have great results of a gospel meeting and a lot of people obeying the gospel as Philip did in Samaria. But he still gave forth the evidence that would have convinced any honest-hearted person in Luke 8, 15, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. He exposed their false philosophies. In both cases, this morning's study of Philip preaching, and as we look at Paul preaching here, they're both preaching the gospel, taking the people where they found them and the mindset they were in, and attempting to lead them on to Jesus Christ and becoming Christians. They work with a few here. They're listed, verse 34. But most said, no, we can't stomach any kind of doctrine that says we've got to come back in this prison house body because they did not see, and they did not see because their false doctrines had blinded them. Nobody challenged him. Is it true that there was a Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Is it true that he was crucified? Is it true that he was raised from the dead to die no more? Nobody challenged that. Nobody said, prove your case further. Let's talk about this more. I want to hear, hear again on this matter. None of that was done. They just heard it. Didn't suit their preconceived notions, and they dropped it. Now, there are a multiplicity of things that we can go through and learn much more than we've touched on in this sermon Paul gave on Mars Hill a long ago. But my point in this morning's sermon and in this sermon is that you must be prepared as a faithful member of the church if you're going to teach the gospel, if you're going to seek souls, to deal with the kind of people that's going to approach you. You're going to have some that are going to be like, though they may be getting fewer and further between, like the Ethiopian eunuch this morning. You're going to have more developing like these people. More who are cut loose from the Bible. They're not familiar with it. They may be third or fourth generation of people that haven't attended any kind of church. And they may not just be neglecting it because it just doesn't fit into things, but they get far more militantly opposed to the truth of the gospel as it is in the New Testament the real thing, in other words. And we've got to be ready to deal with it. Now that brings it back down to this. Are we preparing ourselves? We still have to deal with the regular old denominational false doctrine. The truth about the plan of salvation, about the church, its organization, its work, its worship. All those things that we've dealt with for years that the Bible plainly teaches, we have to know it. But we're going to have to be better prepared to deal with people like these that Paul encountered the long ago on Mars Hill. Why? I've already said it. The world is getting more like that among the Western or within the Western world. So where do we stand? Well, one thing I know is that this is not my father's world. Now, I mean that by my fleshly father. It's not his world. It's not even the world I grew up in. Not at all. It's changed. Those of us who are at least my age saw it change, watched it change. We watched it change to where NBC, ABC, CBS had programs like Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, and so many others, The Donna Reed Show, so many others that were centered around the family that was not antagonistic toward God and religion. We've seen it come over a period of 15, 60 years right down to where people are totally opposed to those things. They're totally secular. And they're getting more militant toward God and Christ and the Bible and religion in general. 
Now we're here. God has not left himself without witness, and we are the church of the living God and members in particular. Now who is he counting on to fight the fight? Now, people my age, I doubt, are going to see things get as bad as more than likely they're going to get. My children probably will see a lot of it, but the grandchildren and great-grandchildren are going to live in a world that is foreign to the world I grew up in as we are from the moon. And then what will it be? So much is on our shoulders today to train and teach ourselves to be able to be what we ought to be. I remember standing, and as I close, I'll, I'll use this. When our children were little, I remember standing in Van Buren where all of them were born, but Timothy was born in Marlton, and also in Muskogee when Timothy was, well, he started kindergarten there. I remember looking out at the audience and say, saying to them, do you realize that your children are grandchildren? I remember we were talking about over 40 years ago. May very well marry a Muslim. May very well marry a Buddhist. You can almost see people, although they wouldn't do it, that'll never be. What are you talking about? And if you could have, which I tried, and other preachers did too, we talked about, because this was before at least part of the time, not all of it that I described, was before 73 and the Supreme Court's ruling on abortion. You couldn't get people to see what we preached, that if you can decide the unborn child is not a human and you can abort him, what does that do at the other end of the spectrum? Which spectrum I'm at right now when it comes to euthanasia? Is that a big thing? Is that being talked about? Is that a part of it when it comes to ethics? Ethical conduct, yeah. You could say those things because I know at 20, 21, and 22, and 23, and up through my 20s, I was saying them in pulpits like this. I wasn't the only one. I still have those outlines I used. If I were to preach now, the outline I would use would be the outline on abortion and euthanasia that I preached almost 50 years ago. Because it's the truth. The truth doesn't change. But the brethren... They couldn't see it. But we've got there now. We're here. And you younger folks with children, I don't know what you're going to do. If you do not stand upon the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of the Bible, and know that the church as it appears in the Bible is the only answer, as it lives faithful to the truth, proclaims and defends the gospel. There is no other hope for you in a world that is growing more unfriendly to the truth of the living God. So, what will it be? I pray continually in my personal devotions for everybody here. And I've learned you can do that over the years. And you can too. That you'll remain faithful. You know how I do it? You do it any way you want to. But you have to have notes. You have to have somebody to help. I do it by pews because I know where most of you sit. So when I'm having a walk during the day or I have some time that's quiet and I engage my prayers, I go right down the pews and everybody that sits on the same pew, because you know you're not going to move you off those pews. You might move you off for other things. But you're not going to get off those pews. You're going to be in the same spot. So it makes it easy to memorize where you are. And I just simply pray going down each pew for each person. It's my brother and sister in the Lord. That way I know I cover them. Because when I get through, then I go back over in my mind and say, have I missed anybody? Now, that's what I do with my feeble mind. How you do it is another story. That's up to you, but you're going to have to do it some way if you're going to pray for everybody in this congregation. Because you certainly can't pray for everybody in the world. But I do also try to pray for all those I know elsewhere. Yeah, but Brother David, that takes time. It sure does. Let me tell you a good time to do it when you're walking. It's a good time to do it. Or when you're out, just sitting there, just looking at things. Nobody knows what's going on up here but God and you. 
So just be praying about it. Pray without ceasing. In all things with prayer and supplication, make your request made known to God. Well, what are we going to do if we don't stay true to the book? What hope? Let me ask you, what hope do you have? If you remove this book from your life, every aspect of it from your life, what are you going to do? If it was true 100 years ago, and if it was true when I was baptized on May 27, 1959, if it was true 2,000 years ago, it is true now and will be true on the day of judgment. It will sustain us, folks. It will keep us going. And even though you're just a handful, that handful will be right with God. And if God be for us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not a child of God, we beg of you to obey the gospel this evening by believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. If as a child of God you've erred, then we beg of you to acknowledge it, repent of it, confess it, and pray God for forgiveness. If you need to obey the truth, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.